Well, praise the Lord, friends, and welcome to another exciting edition of our Study of the Word broadcast with Apostle David Kaiser, Jr. A Study of the Word is an evangelistic outreach of rightly dividing the Word Church of God, located in Mobile, Alabama. Stay tuned for the next 30 minutes as we take you live into the sanctuary with Apostle David Kaiser, Jr. You be blessed.
their energy, and yes, their assets, meaning spiritual, mental, emotional, and yes, financial abilities to the ministry of church. Amen. Amen. First Timothy 5 and 17, and it reads again. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. The work of ministers consists primarily of two things. One, ruling well, and two, laboring in the word and doctrine. This was the main business of elders or presbyters in the days of the apostles. The honor was due to those who were not idle, but laborers in this work. They were worthy of double honor, esteem, and maintenance. This is likely meant to imply that both respect and as well as financial support will do. But verse 18 makes the financial aspect of this double honor clear. This is a key passage in understanding the New Testament stance on those who earn their living through service to the church. But we'll come back to verse 18 later. The word rule, rule means to manage or conduct affairs, to guide in a unified way towards a definitive goal, to direct or control. Now control meant in an, uh, dic by dictionary.com means to influence. So they influence people often by tact, address, or artifice. And artifice meant cunning, ingenuity. But rule in the Greek is interpreted as perestos. That's P-R-O-E-S-T-O -E with the posture above it. I mean, not a posture, I mean hyphen above, I'm sorry. T-E-S. It's P-R-O-E-S-T-O with a hyphen above it, T-E-S, which literally means to oversee, superintend, or manage. In verse 17, this double or two-sided honor is especially intended for those whose primary task is pastoral, those who labor in preaching and teaching. Both preaching and teaching are considered important work for an elder. An elder has other biblical expectations as well especially prayer as described in Acts 6, chapter 6, verses 1 through 7, and congregational care as example in 1 Peter verses, uh, chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. Now, if you can, turn to Acts chapter 6, verse 1, please. When you get that, say amen. Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. And it reads, and in those days when the number of the disciples were mu was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, it is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the same pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas and Nicholas as a proselyte, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And the word of God increased, and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. And again, it says, in those days, when the number of disciples were multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in a daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of disciples unto them and said, it is not reason or logical that we should leave the word of God to serve tables, work a job. 
Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost, whom we may appoint over this business. And we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the same pleased the multitude. And they chose Stephen, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parnas, and Nicholas, a prophet of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid hands on them, and the word of God increased. Now prayer, fasting, studying the word of God, and laying on of hands are essential and critical works for those that are in pastoral or senior leadership positions. Prayer, fasting, studying the word of God, and laying on of hands are essential and critical works of those that are in pastoral and senior leadership positions. Now turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. You can get that saved, man. Amen. In uh, chapter 5, verse 1 reads, The elders which are among you, I exhort, that is, that I admonish and encourage you who am or are also an elder, and the witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed or teach the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, that is without limitations or restrictions, but willingly, not for filthy, that means foul, disgusting, or vulgar, lucre, that's monetary reward or gain, but of a ready or prepared mind, neither as being lost over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock, that means leads by an example. Now back to verse 17. What exactly did Paul mean by the expression counted worthy of double honor? Did Paul simply mean that ministers should be paid a double salary? Part of the key lays in understanding the translation of the word honor. Now we're going to look at three Greek words that translates as honor. The first Greek word I want to look at is translated into honor is time. It's spelled T-I-M-E, not pronounced like our English word time, but it's pronounced as T-M-A, that's T-E-E-M-A-Y, T-M-A. It is used 43 times in the New Testament, and it's translated 33 times as honor, eight times as price, one time as precious, and one time as song. And this is the connotation in which Paul used it in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. The second word I want to look at is opsonion. That's O-P-S-O-N-I-O-N. Which is used four times in the New Testament, and it means a wage. Something that is paid for the performance of a task. This word is also used by Paul in Romans 6 and 23. The wages of sin is death. And in 2 Corinthians 11 and 8, I robbed other churches taking wages of them to do you service. So opsonium is translated into wage, which is something that is paid for the performance of a test. The third word that I want to look at is mistos. And that's M-I-S. T-H-O-S. And this word, mistos, is used 29 times in the New Testament. And it means dues paid for work. The fruits naturally resulting from toils and endeavors. Jesus used honor in the form of mistos in John 4 and 36. And he said, he that reaps receives wages. Jesus Christ himself says, someone who works as a laborer in the fields receives wages for the work that they have done. Let's look more closely at the Greek word time, which Paul used in, verse, in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17, which is translated as honor. Thea's Greek 
The English lexicon of the New Testament defines the Greek word teme as follows. Number one, a valuing by which a price is fixed. A valuing by which the price is fixed. Number two, honor which belongs to or is shown to someone. The honor of one who outranks others. The honor which belongs to or is shown to one. The honor of one who outranks others. Three, it means veneration, deference, reverence, praise of one which is judged worthy. The third definition was veneration, deference, reverence, praise of one which is judged worthy. It is in this sense that the word refers to a valuing by which the price is fixed. So we can say that honor means a valuing by which the price is fixed. When the Greek word time is used in a positive text, it refers to the bestowing of honor and recognition on someone who has been valued to be worthy of such honor. So teammate refers to the valuing process rather than the price itself. Teammate refers to the valuing process rather than the price itself. So keep that thought in your mind. That is why it is translated into English as honor and as veneration and as respect because those words imply that we have assigned a certain value to a person. Now don't take this next statement offensively. Not all ministers are, are equal qualified in the helping and serving of God's people. Amen. Amen. I didn't say that you weren't qualified. Mm -hmm. I said not all ministers are equally qualified. See, that's the difference. So that's why I don't want anybody to take offense. <clears throat> I believe that with every different anointing, there comes a different level of honor and respect Amen. carried with it. In the church, there are different offices, different weights of anointing, different responsibilities and qualifications, which are evidenced by the fruits that are produced by each, as referenced in 1 Corinthians 12 and 28. And y'all can get that uh, in your Bibles. Turn to 1 Corinthians 12 and 28. See, I believe Pastor started ministering in 1982. If I'm correct, 1982. So from 1982 to 2020, he has all that experience and time in the word. From 1982 to 2020, God has been giving him revelation constantly yeah. in this word. So even though I am a minister, I am nowhere near pastor's equal. So that's why I say, you know, not all men are equally qualified. Mm -hmm. I'm not qualified at this stage of my life to do what Pastor does. Amen. Especially seeing what he does and the degree of patience that it takes to be in his position. Amen. You know, and if. <laughs> well. First <laughs> mm -hmm. right. Corinthians 12, verses 28. Amen. And it reads, and God have set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Now turn to Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4 and 11. You can get that say amen. Ephesians 4 and 11. Amen. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Now the list in Ephesians 4 and 11 has inserted another group, evangelists, in between the second and third group of 1 Corinthians 12 and 28, which are prophets and teachers. But take note that in Ephesians 4 and 11, Paul references pastors and teachers as one group. Pastors really must have the ability to teach 
in order to be able to pastor a congregation of God's people. I'm going to say that again. Pastors must have an ability to teach to be able to pastor a congregation of God's people. Because I can get up here and call scriptures all day and not have any insight as to what I'm reading. And I can read scripture after scripture after scripture after scripture. But if I don't see God on how to explain it to you to where to open the eyes of your understanding and that your spiritual ears be open so that you can hear what the Spirit of God is saying unto you. All I've did was just read a bunch of scriptures to you. Romans 10 and 17. Turn if you will please. And they'll say Amen. Excuse me. Romans 10 and 17. It reads, So then faith, which is the power given to man by God to change things in this natural world, cometh by hearing, which is the ability to learn by ear, by being told or inform, informed of, or by being taught. And hearing, the process of learning by listening to, by giving or paying the earnest attention to, the word of God. It says, so then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But we know faith is a power given to man by God to change things in the natural world. Hearing is the ability to learn by ear, by being told or informed of, or by being taught. And hearing again is the process of learning by listening to or by giving or paying earnest attention to. See, hearing has two different contexts. You can learn by hearing because somebody has to teach you. That's why in college you have those professors who give their exhortations. So they get up in front of the class and they teach you or tell you what they, the information they want you to know and that's one way of learning. Same thing in the church. Pastor gets up and explains the word of God to you in your hearing. Now, your part of hearing is learning what, you, what you've heard through your ears by listening to and paying earnest attention to it. Right. See, that means, that means it's, it's your part of the hearing. Your part of the hearing is an active involvement on your part. It's an active involvement on your part, meaning that you just can't come to church and sit there. You can just come to church and sit there and listen and not partake of anything that being, that's being said. Right. But when you're actively engaged in your, in your listening or your hearing, then that's how you're being learning from what you've heard. And then that's how faith comes. So that's what that scripture means. Now it's apparent that in order to hear the word of God, you must be taught the word of God. But the word of God that you are hearing or being taught must be rightly divided or explained so that scriptural context and intent remains pure and true. It is the truth of God's word that brings about a hope and confidence in God that our spirit man will bear witness to so that faith is built up and increased within us. For out of the abundance of a heart, a man speaks. If you haven't been taught the word of faith, What's in you, meaning your spirit, man, will come out. Yeah. Especially during those times when life happens. Yeah. See, what's in you, what's in your spirit, man, is what you're going to speak. Because that's what's in your heart. Yeah. Especially during these times, so that the atmosphere of this country and the world today. You know, and, and sometimes, you know, I was telling my wife, you know, it's, it's grievous to hear so many believers. Not speaking the word of faith. I wonder what they're being taught. What they're learning. What they're hearing. Because what's in them. Is not, what's supposed to be in them. Is not what's coming out. Again 2 Timothy 2 and 15. Says study to show thyself approved. Unto God. A workman that need not be ashamed. But rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, pastor says all the time that he's a teaching priest. Yeah. 
That's why he often asks, if you're all all right, doing a missus. Because if you're not all right, he's going to slow down and make sure that you are all right. That's his no child of God left behind program. See, the world instituted that in the school system. But pastor in this church, I can say that he honestly has a no child of God left behind program instituted for us. He wants each and every one of us up to speed in the things of God and on the tricks of the devil. The scripture said, my people pray for lack of knowledge. No, not only lack of knowledge in the things of God, but also lack of knowledge about the intense plot plans and schemes of the adversary. You got to be able to recognize it when it comes. His game don't change. It stays the same. Now, it may be presented in a different form, but it's the same game. A good pastor cares for his congregation. How many times when life happens that we have needed pastor? Who can honestly say that they need a pastor and he was not available? I don't see any hands. John chapter 10, verses 12 through 13. You can get that say amen. I, I learned, you know, doing this, start studying of this message, man. I, I got into it, man, and God just started revealing stuff, and it started blowing up, and it just started going in different areas. And I was like, Lord, I need, Lord, just give me something to stay focused on one track, because it, it's so much in this, you know. And you know, and I see what Pastor means now. You know, when you get into this word, you know, how when you actually get to studying and reading, man, revelation comes. You know, it'd it be hard to cut it off. <laughs> you know. And I was just like, you know, especially on this particular subject matter, you know, about, about honoring our leaders and how we should, we should properly honor our leaders. It's a lot in this. It regards of what the world may think, but it's, it's a lot in this. John chapter 10, verses 12 to 13, y'all there? It says, but he that is a hireling and not a shepherd, who's owned the sheep or not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth, because he is a hireling, and careth not for the sheep. Sadly, many people are being led by hirelings, and not a true shepherd. They don't have the heart of God for God's people. Jeremiah 3.15 says, And I will give you pastors according to my own heart, which shall feed you with the knowledge and understanding. Here again, a pastor must have the ability to teach the people of God. 2 Timothy 2 and 24 says, And the servant of the Lord must, be, must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, and patient. Yes. Now we know that pastor and co-pastor are gentle, yes. eager, yes. and patient, yes. especially when they're teaching the word of God to their people. I say their people because we at this particular ministry are the sheep of the pastor that God has given them to watch or shepherd over. Amen. See, we are his sheep of the pastor that God has given him to watch over. And that's honorable all in itself. Yeah. Would you not agree? Amen. I thank God that we don't have hirelings, but we have shepherds. Amen. I thank God for that. Romans 2 and 10 says, But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh the good, to the Jew first, and also unto the Gentile. So pastor does a good work. And the Bible says, glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh the good. Pastor does a good work here. So those are some things that he should be benefiting by the work that he's done. He should be receiving some glory. Not glory that's due to God, but glory that's due to him as being in his position, in leadership position, in honor and peace. You know, and that peace, you know, it covers a multitude of areas, but I think one of the greatest areas that I think pastor has peace in, that he don't have to go with a heavy heart before God on our behalf. You know, that is an extreme amount of peace to your man of God, when he don't have to go grudgingly to God for you. 
Not saying that he won't go to God for you. But it shouldn't be a grievous thing to him to have to go with God on your behalf for anything. 1 Timothy 5 and 18. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muscle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. Again, verse 18 says, For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. The word muzzle means to restrain from speech, to prevent the expression of opinion, to suppress. That's what muzzle means. To restrain from speech, to prevent the expression of opinion, to suppress. You know, pa pastors should, pastors should and need to have the ability to freely speak the word of God All right. without fear of reprisals Amen. within the organization. Amen. You know, that, that's a form of Muslim, Muslim. You know, they should be able to freely preach the truth of God's words to the people. Amen. The word tread, treadeth, coming from the root word tread means to step, walk, or trample on so as to suppress, so as to press, crush, or injure. Tread, coming from the root word tread, means to step, walk, or trample so as to press, crush, or injure. And worthy again means having adequate or great merit, character, or value of commendable excellence or merit means deserving. Reward. Reward is compensation, pay, or remuneration. And remuneration is the ability to understand the numerical techniques of mathematics. I mean, count up the money. <laughs> if you had to break it down, that's what that means, count up the money. <laughs> the same scripture in Deuteronomy 25 and 4 says, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. See, the beasts that were employed in treading out of corn were allowed to feed while they did the work. Yes. So that the more work they did, the more food they ate. Right. Therefore, let the leaders that labor in the word and doctrine be well provided for. For the laborer is worthy of his reward. Amen. And there is all the reason in the world that they should have it. The world uses this principle in all areas of life. We see it operating in sports and entertainment industry, the business world, and politics. Now, I understand sports and entertainment and business, but the last one, well, y'all you know, know what I'm saying. But it's interesting, nobody has any problem with any of the above mentioned people, i.e. athletes, entertainers, both actors and musicians, making millions of dollars. But let a man or woman of God get a multi-million dollar deal for lack of better words. The first thing out their mouths is going to be what? Don't no preacher need a million dollars. Them preachers just want to get your money. That's the first thing they say. They can't say that God blessed them. No, the preacher's stealing the folks' money. You know, they don't bit more, know nothing about how the man of God got what he got or the woman of God got what they got. They don't know what God did for them, whose heart God touched to bless them. But that's the first thing out their mouth is the accusation. You know, preachers don't need no million dollars. Well, if you don't want the preacher to have a million dollars, who you want to have it? And it's really sad. Especially when another believer expresses the same sentiments as long as, uh, it's really sad, especially when another believer expresses the same sentiments as and along with a non-believer. You know, Bob says, touch not my anointing and do my prophet no harm. You don't have to touch them with your hands. You can touch them with your words. So be wary of those who do that, especially if you're of the household of faith, if you're a believer. 
If anybody should understand kingdom principles and blessings, it should be a believer. It should be another child of God. Amen. Amen. Uh, Matthew chapter 10. We're going to go to verse 1, and then we're going to drop down to verses 5 through 10. When you're there, say amen. Matthew chapter 10, verse, uh, verse 1, then we're going to drop down to 5 to 10. It says, And when he, had called upon, when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Verse 5, Then the 12 Jesus sent forth, these 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans, into ye not. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely ye have received, freely ye give. Provide neither gold, nor silver, nor brass in your purses, nor script for the journey. Neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet staffs, for the workman is worthy of his meat. You know, and I found, you know, I was reading it, you know, he sent them, he didn't send them out into the world first. He sent the disciples out to the church. And he said, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So Jesus sent his he sent his pastors not out into the world, but into the church. He had to go bring them back first. And he gave them some instructions that I'm quite sure that he had taught them on. He gave them power against the unclean spirits, cast them out, and to heal all manner of sicknesses and disease. He taught, Jesus taught the disciples how to heal. By the laying on of hands and by prayer. You know, even when Jesus did it, he asked the people that he was healing, you know, do you believe I can do this? And he said, you know, be it according to your faith. So again, we have an active part in, to, you, to uh, minister and use what we've been taught. Preaching and teaching are areas specifically worthy of mention when considering financial support. Paul earned money as a tent maker at times, in addition to sharing the gospel. But whenever possible, he gave his full time and energy to preaching. And I got an impact statement. And it reads, the work of the ministry is not an incentive program, i.e., the better you do your job, the more money you will earn. That is not what the, that is not what the ministry is intended to be a vocation for a financial incentive program. Mm -hmm. For those in pastoral positions, the work of the ministry is not just a job, but a lifestyle that should be birthed out of the heart of God and deposited into the spirit and heart of a man for his, meaning God's people. See, it's not an incentive program, but it's a lifestyle that's birthed out of the heart of God and deposited into a man or woman of God, into their spirit and their heart for his people. That's why God said in Jeremiah 3 15, I will give you pastor after my own heart. Yeah. That means God literally took some of his heart and placed into those that he's ordained, ordained to be a pastor. So y'all don't understand what that meant. What we have standing before us every Sunday and every Tuesday is actually the heart of God for us. Amen. God is literally pouring out his heart service after service to us. Mm. Mm. Thank you, God. Acts 18, verses 1 through 4. You get that, say amen. Acts chapter 18, verses 1 through 4. Amen. 
It says, after these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy, with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought. For by their occupation, they were tent makers. And he reasoned in a synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And I'm going to read verse 4 again. It says, And he reasoned or persuaded by the use of logical thinking or the drawing of logical conclusions from facts and premises based on the teachings of Jesus Christ in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. Paul was a tent maker by trade, meaning at times he worked to support himself. But Paul, all while working in his profession as a tent maker, was not distracted from the job of being an apostle and as a minister in a local congregation, in addition to looking after one of the larger congregations in existence at the time. First Thessalonians 2 and 9 says, For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail, for laboring night and day, because we could not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you, unto you the gospel of God. In other words, Paul was reminding the people about how he had worked to provide for his own needs. In my estimation, so that he, so that he wouldn't, didn't want to be a burden to the people due to the size of the congregation. Meaning they probably had a small congregation. And Paul didn't want to burden them with his needs. So he worked to support himself during that time. I remember, like many presidents today should, pastor working all day, every day, week after week, still holding midweek service, preaching at any and other communications that God opened the door for, whether it be local or abroad, and still seeking God for a word on Sunday morning so not to neglect his own flock. Yes, then going the next day, hitting the clock, continuing on like that, second by second, minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day, week by week, month after month, year after year, until God saw fit for him to go full time in the ministry. Right. See, some of y'all were here, some of y'all wouldn't. Pastor would go, go, go. Amen. Study, work, study, work, preach, study, work, preach, study. And, it went, and that was a continual cycle for him. All while doing other things, going abroad, doing those things outside in the field that God had for him to do, he still was seeking a God for a word for his own people. He still had a, a, a flock to shepherd. He didn't neglect his own flock. While feeding other people's sheep, he still fed his own sheep. And that takes a lot. Amen. That's why you got to have physical strength and endurance, Amen. along with skill to handle this word. Because I know for me, you know, working my job, I still had to, you know, once I got the call that I was doing this, because I was wondering why I didn't get called for Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I was waiting, and I was like, okay, well, you know what? So and so went up, I was waiting. My wife went up, I was waiting. I said, well, no call. I said, I might have slid by. <laughs> but <laughs> somebody said, early. <laughs> early. <laughs> One morning. <laughs> my phone rang. <laughs> so, but it was, it, it's an honor and a pleasure, though, to be able to be here to do this. You know, and God saw fit for him to go full time in the ministry. And most time when he first started it, you know, taking very little to no salary. He just wanted to see the people of God blessed in every area of their lives. So if you haven't figured it out by now, verse 18 refers to a wage or mistos. That means do pay for work, a salary, i.e. money. See, God, both under the law and now under the gospel, has taken special care to see that his ministers are well provided for. Amen. Does God not take care of the oxen? Right. Then how much more will he not take care of his own servants? Amen. The ox only trails out the corn, 
or which they make the bread that perishes. But ministers break the bread of life which endures forever. Uh, Matthew 6 and 25 through 33. Get that say amen. Verse 25. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor what nor yet for your body. What you shall put on is not life more than meat. And the body more than raiment. Behold the fowls of the air. For they sow not. Neither do they reap. Nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you by taking thought. Can add one cubit to his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field. How they grow. They toil not. Neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which to this day is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we be clothed? For all these things do Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that all ye that knoweth that ye have need of all of these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. It is God's appointment that those who preach the gospel should live of the gospel. That is to be maintained and supported by the ministry of church. First Corinthians nine and fourteen reads. Even so, the Lord hath ordained that we, they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. So it is their just due. As much as the reward of the laborer, just as one who receives wages for a task performed. Even though God is, has, and always taken care of his chosen anointed, please understand that he, our Father God, did not completely abdicate or relieve us of any and all responsibilities in this area. Amen. God's going to do his part. But he also gave us a part to play. In the support of the ministry. Here again. 1 Timothy 5 and 17 through 18 reads. It refers to the valuing process. Not the monetary price itself. But the valuing process. The question I will pose to you here today under the sound of my voice is this. How much do you truly value the ministerial giftings that God has placed in and over your life? I'm going to ask you that again. You don't have to answer me, but answer within your own hearts. How much value do you truly place on the ministerial giftings that God has placed in and over your life? Everybody has their own valuing system. Mm -hmm. You do it. I ain't paying that much for that. Yeah. You know, when you go to the store to go buy them, I'm not paying that much for that. I like that, I, I like that Benz, but I ain't paying that for that. I'll wait a couple of years in case when somebody took some of the interest off of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how we think of the natural. Mm -hmm. But when we're talking about, the, and those things fade away. Yeah. You know, you you can buy a brand new Benz and drive off the lot and it get totaled. Oh, yeah. The minute the front tire hit the street, that Benz done lost about ten to $15,000 worth of its value. Yeah. But you have somebody that's devoting themselves completely, engulfing themselves completely and totally and wholeheartedly in the word of God to be able to bring you something that's going to impact your life, help change your situation, possibly share a word with you that's going to protect your natural mortal life. Because 
You know, even, you know, I was, when I was looking at that, you know, you, had, you, you hear people sometimes say, I'm tied up, tangled up, and wrapped up in this word. Well, if you're tied up, wrapped up, and tangled up in the wrong way, you're in a mess. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody got to come undo all that. Yeah. <laughs> because if you get tied up, tangled up, and, and wrapped up enough, you can suffocate. So, you know, you're going to need somebody to untangle some things for you so that you can have some freedom, have some movement. How much value were you placed on that? If pastor gives you a word through prophets and say, hey, look, you're supposed to go somewhere this afternoon, but I hear the spirit of the Lord say don't go. Because if you do go, it's not going to be well for you. Now you have a choice. But if you decide to go and you hear about something that happened to the people that you were supposed to went with, and you would say, man, if I want to listen to the man of God, see, God just saved your life. It wasn't a word from the book, but it was a word of life. So here again, 1 Timothy verses 5, chapter 5, verse 17 through 18 refers to the valuing process and not the monetary price itself. And I'm going to read those same scriptures again out the message Bible. It says, 1 Timothy 5, 17 through 18, not the message Bible. And it reads, give a bonus to the leaders who do a good job, especially the ones who work hard at preaching and teaching. Scripture tells us, don't muzzle a working ox, and a worker deserves his pay. And that's all I have, and I hope y'all were blessed and received something from this word. Turn it back into the hands of Prophet Cook. You have just been blessed by studying the word broadcast with Apostle David Kaiser Jr. If you would like an audio or video copy of today's message, please email us at rdtwtvpros at gmail.com. Connect with us daily on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, or Ustream to catch past shows, words of encouragement, special events, or join us live in the sanctuary. We're located at 760 Ermira Street in Mobile, Alabama. Our service times are Sunday school at 9.30 a.m., Sunday morning worship at 11 o'clock, and Tuesday night Bible study at 7 p.m. Join us at this same time next week for a study in the word broadcast with Apostle David Kaiser Jr. You be